I am Avisha Sood and I'm an associate with TPA Global. I'll be speaking today along with my colleague Marjorie van der Bock. She's a partner with TPA Global in Amsterdam. And today we will take you through which compliance deadlines you should be looking out for and what should be your attitude towards not only meeting but complying with these deadlines from a risk management point of view. So to start with, uh, just two minutes on the broad index, what will we be covering? We'll discuss today the changing scene of tax, which clearly has increased the compliance burden. But in our view, that's only the smallest of the things that MNEs should worry about. The more important element that comes out of it is what should be your risk management plan around all the multitude of deadlines that you now, as a multinational company, after BEPS, have to meet. So for this, we will start with what has changed in the post peps world of tax, why is risk management important, and what happens if you do compliance without risk management. As a next step, we will uh, talk to you a little bit about what we call a BEPS action calendar. What is it? Why should you make it? What benefits does it bring to you? As a next step, we will cover if you do not adopt this approach, what is your real risks for a company? And if you do adopt this approach, what benefits can it bring to you, not just in the current year, but going forward in future years as well? And then we will close the webinar with taking you through a series of steps that you need to follow to be fully in control of your operations and tax and TP policies. With this, we move to the first part, and I hand over the floor to Maji, who will talk to you about tax in the post peps world. Thank you, Avisha. Obviously, the world of taxation is changing rapidly. Prior to the BEPS initiative, non-disclosure by corporates was a realistic tool for dispute avoidance, facilitated by tolerant tax and transfer pricing regimes in multiple jurisdictions. For a long time, not much more was required than some standard transfer pricing documentation and the filing of a corporate tax return. There was limited automation, as the compliance burden was not that high and expensive. It was all about tax planning, with which serious benefits could be achieved, as we all know. The tax and transfer pricing function formed a real profit center for corporates. However, nowadays, with the introduction of BEPS, transfer pricing compliance is no longer so straightforward. Corporates are facing more and more challenges to produce master file and country-specific local files in a rapidly growing number of jurisdictions with country-by-country -country reports on top that are due by the very large multinationals. The exchange of all these reports between multiple jurisdictions, coupled with specific programs run by, run by some national governments, will enable tax authorities to challenge tax and transfer pricing structure, structures of taxpayers right away. Such a program is, for example, the International Compliance Assurance Program, where seven countries are collaborating to develop a joint assessment mechanism. The seven participating countries in this program are Australia, Canada, Italy, the Netherlands, Spain, the UK, and the USA. Uh, in this uncertain environment, with tax authorities adopting an aggressive approach towards corporate taxpayers, where double or even triple tax on the same profit might become the new standard, the reputation of the company and its management board is also at stake. The space for planning is much less, and the tax and transfer pricing compliance is become a huge burden, and process efficiency and automation need serious attention. As a result of these developments, the tax and transfer pricing function is becoming more and more a cost center for the company, rather than a profit center. Moreover, as also already mentioned by Efficia, Compliance is not only about just meeting all filing deadlines, which should just be a given. It should be a given that you have your processes in place to meet all your filing obligations of all the different filings required in each jurisdiction. But this is only the first step. The focus also has to be on the risk management side of it. To be fully in control in this post-patch world, 
corporates have to allow themselves sufficient time to run various ratio analysis, carry out a risk management process based on the results of the ratio analysis, check and implement a governance structure supporting its operating model, implement a software to carry out routine and repetitive tasks, etc., prior to the actual submission of any filing to ensure there are no mismatch mismatches between financials in corporate tax returns, local files, master file, and C by C reporting. And this brings us to the next slide. Risks of compliance without risk management. In the post-batch world, it is becoming more and more important to move away from a staying out of trouble attitude and adopt a proactive role in the journey towards full control. This diagram shows situations in which you only just stay out of trouble. The first one is being reactive. Taxpayers tend to be reactive to tax problems and tax risks, so only resolving disputes and not pre preventing them, and that is a common mistake seen in most corporate taxpayers' behavior. This, in the post-patch world, easily translates into additional tax exposure through the imposition of tax penalties and interest and will lead to poor relationships with the tax authorities. Proactive tax risk management, however, will help eliminate the additional tax exposure, improve relationships with tax authorities, and place control of the tax risk management process back in the hands of the corporates. The second case, siloed approach. Adopting a siloed approach where tax does not interact with the other operational departments of your company is another mistake that leads to mismatches between tax and operational conduct which is the cornerstone of BEPS. To be in full control, the tax team has to interact with all key stakeholders on a regular basis, from the CEO, CFO, the board and the audit committee, to the financial auditor and finance colleagues, the legal team and tax advisors. Three is the lack of efficient management. Lack of an overarching strategy to guide the tax team to work hand in hand with the business is a hurdle commonly faced by the tax teams of multinationals. Creating clear strategy and government roles with clear reporting lines will go a long way in aligning tax with your operational conduct. Four is the lack of facts. Lack of facts often lead to bad tax compliance and unnecessary mistakes that can be avoided. Getting to the bottom of the facts and obtaining a good understanding of your value chain takes time and effort, but only thereafter the technical expertise can be applied properly in order to save yourself from mismatches in substance and form, so lack of fact to support your policies. Then there's also the fifth, the one, the blind faith in internal audit. Financial accounting supplies the numbers on which tax compliance is based. Simply relying on these numbers is no longer enough. Internal checking or audit procedures must be expanded to self-audit and checking the higher tax risk areas in a business not directly visible from the figures to proactively prevent controversy. Uh, the lack of communication, of internal and external communication, of, of, the, of, of tax and other policies will also lead not only to mismatches between facts and policies, but also expose your company to potential lawsuits from investors who do not fully understand and support the company's policies or the company's tax policies. And with this, I hand over to Avisha, who will talk about the BEPS filing calendar. Thanks, Raji. So, I guess the background of this uh, presentation is clear to all of you. The risks of being non-compliant are self-evident. But how to be compliant in the post-PEPS world requires two uh, main objectives. To start with, you need to be aware of all your filing deadlines and at what time in the year they arise. And as a second step, before any of those deadlines arise, you should carry out 
a set of risk management steps which we will detail on in this presentation to make sure any information that you report in one filing deadline as a result of one filing deadline does not contradict any of the information that you will be filing in the future so for this purpose the first step is you need to be aware of what your filing deadlines are that's why we've made what we call a BEPS action calendar or a BEPS filing calendar. It contains uh, information on a country level of CIT deadlines, local file and master file deadlines, the information that you need to put in master and local files, CBCR deadlines, and TP forms that you need to submit in, these, in each country. TPA Global has made has made this BEPS action calendar covering all major jurisdictions where we have validated the information presented on the screen in front of you against original sources and the same information has been validated by our local alliance experts in those jurisdictions to make sure to keep a track of newly available information with countries signing up to the BEP standards every day. It's important to make sure you are aware of the latest filing deadlines. Then what does this mean, this BEPS action calendar mean for you as a company? It is said we at TPA Global have made this extensive calendar, but as a company, you perhaps don't need all the key details in that calendar. So as a first step of using that calendar, you as a company should draw out your, your full year plan from January to December and mark out which deadlines are upcoming. What you see on the slide in front of you is not just uh, an indication of which deadlines are approaching, but also an indication of which deadlines are more important or more risky than the others. On what basis is this decided, you might ask? It is either your company's audit history in that country or that country's tax authorities have in the past shown an aggressive attitude, etc., etc. factors that are special to each company should be taken into account while drawing up a while drawing up a calendar that looks like this now coming back to our main point on why should you have this risk management approach to beps action calendar what does this do for you to start with as we just said you chalk out all your compliance deadlines for the year to make sure you do not get caught in any penalties at the very least then as a next step and as a first step to be in control, you should try to gain control over your financial and tax data analytics. What this means in simpler terms is you should try to run various ratio analyses to uh, your first start here could be to start with running the CBCR ratio analysis that the OECD has indicated in its handbook for effective tax risk assessment published in the last quarter of the last year where 19 outlier analysis uh, ratios are presented by the OECD. You could start with that. You could start with just simple ones such as operating profit versus FTEs. And if those ratios present a red flag to you, perhaps the, what you should be doing in managing those red flags should start from the beginning of the year rather than at the end either when you're questioned by a tax authority or at the time of filing of your C by CR and such. Then next, after you have gained control over your finance and tax data analytics, which should be done by contacting all teams in your company rather than talking in silos to finance or tax or HR or operational teams. The next clear step would be to align, to set clear uh, reporting lines to make sure A, not every theme does not work in silos and that the approach you develop at a global level for your company is broken down at entity level and followed as well. This would go a long way in ensuring that there are no misalignments between your financial operating and governance models. That in simpler terms, this, what this simply means that if you, make, if you make a master file and a local file that depicts an entity as a profit center, the financials of that entity should be reflecting the same story as well as 
the governance model showing what the people in those entity have been entrusted with the roles and responsibilities i mean also correspond to the profile of a profit center if that is written in any of your tp documents for example as a next step what uh, with the increasing compliance burden the number of filing deadlines and preparation deadlines are increasing which also means that a lot of this work is also going to be routine and repetitive that you just need to complete year by year so therefore it's worth investing in the first year some time and effort into carving out which in your company are routine repetitive tasks and to the extent possible employing a software to take care of those routine and repetitive tasks so that you as a company can streamline your cost relating to tax tp filings as well as make sure there are no mismatches due to the fact that there were multiple people involved in preparing those reports and last as a last step if you have a clear idea of what your deadlines are what goes into each filing and preparation preparatory document and if you are sure that everything in those document is aligned with each other your last final step is communication with all stakeholders as marji was just talking a few minutes ago communication with stakeholders is important at all levels to make sure a you're not working in silos and all teams everywhere are involved and are aware of what's happening and b it's also important to make sure that your employees have faith in the company's policies and the policies on tax and transfer pricing are also a part of that we have seen a few cases recently in which a vessel blower who did not have faith in the company's tax policies has blown the vessel on company's operations and the company being unprepared has not been able to get itself out of a dispute this is the case of caterpillar which we will be discussing in further sections of this document as well of this slide show as well with this i uh, we move on to the next section where we will discuss with you why a web action calendar is important in the post webs world I ask marshi to begin with this yeah thank you afisha so clearly the work burden on tax and transfer pricing compliance obligations has increased very significantly as just explained by afisha um here you see um the huge change how it is visualized on this slide and oh yeah you're already on the next slide prior to webs corporates had to file a corporate tax return with some local the transfer pricing forms and documents here and there but post webs an effective financial year, financial year 2016 for many countries corporates will be required to file corporate tax returns as well as local transfer pricing forms as well as compliant local files and master files and potentially CYC reporting and all these filings need to be aligned and tell the same story as in the end all these layer of reporting layers of reporting arrive on one and the same desk of the tax inspector we can go to the to the next slide here on this slide um you see an example uh, this is the output of the beps filing calendar prepared for one of our clients if you assume one entity per country and a multinational is present in 19 countries the number of filings will be at least 19 times 5 is 95 because the multiplier 5 is of the corporate tax return the local the transfer pricing forms the local and master file and the cyc report and so at a minimum 95 filings will be due if you are present in 19 countries however most likely it will be way more uh, due to the multiple to multiple enti uh, entities per country and um and as you can see uh, in this example uh, the multinational has already 65 entities in the 90 countries which results in many more filings than 19 times 5 and um, i hand over to afisha again right and this is an example of what a uh, increased burden could lead to so if you were not aware or keeping a track through what we described as the beps action calendar a minute ago of your filing deadlines what could happen you could run you already know you could run into high penalties but 
with the new regulations coming in, we take here an example we noticed with one of our clients. We had a company that crossed the 750 million euro threshold and was required to file a um, C by CR. This company was headquartered in country A and country A has a mechanism for filing of C by CR. So the company registered to file a CBCR in this country. And this country also has spontaneous exchange of C by CR with the Republic of South Korea. However, what the company did not know was that South Korea has provide has brought forward a notification which you need to file if you are part of a group that requires to file the C by CR and you are not headquartered in South Korea, that is, you will be filing it in any other jurisdiction, that needs to be indicated to the South Korean tax authorities through the means of a C by C notification, which has to be filed six months in advance of the actual C by CR filing. And if you do not manage to file this notification indicating which entity will be ultimately filing the C by CR, guess what the penalty is? You have to file the C by CR in South Korea itself. In the case of our client, it was especially detrimental because their, the country in which they are headquartered extended the deadline for C by C, therefore providing the m and &E a chance to revise or review or revisit its C by C data before filing. Whereas this, this company had not filed for a notification in South Korea and was at a risk of file either filing the CBCR in an unprepared manner in South Korea or pay a heavy penalty to the South Korean government. This goes on to show why you should be chalking out your web action calendar with all timelines at the beginning of the year rather than coming up with these deadlines coming up with these deadlines at the end of the year which could lead to you to not only penalties but other consequences such as actual filing of C by CR and filing of C by CR if you have not been prepared could be disastrous for you because those reports will be shared amongst various tax authorities as well. And if one tax authority sees they are getting a smaller share of the pie in respect of the total taxes paid in the world, they, could, they are very likely to come and question your company's operations in that country. Another example, another reason why we need to do, we need to uh, take into account the BEPS action calendar and align our filing filing deadlines is because in the pre-BEPS world, the focus was when the tax authorities would look at your tax or transfer pricing filings, they would try to check whether the economic reality or the legal reality and the financial reality, meaning thereby the conduct of the parties and agreements, etc., were aligned. But in the post-BEPS world, there are still three realities, but they have become a little bit more extensive with the addition of a governance model as well. Now, the tax authorities in the post-BEPS world want to see where are the people who are making the key decisions. Is if what is written in the contract, is it also, rep is it also represented in the governance model of a company? What does the business card of a manager say? Is that is a person who's responsible for managing a per particular operational flow for a company? Ha what are the reporting lines for that person? Who is he reporting into, he or she reporting into? And who are the people reporting into him? Is of extreme importance as well while looking at what the company does and what it reports in its, fina in its tax books. To explain this further, we would like to use an example. Here we present the, on the left side of the visual a uh, tax structure of Apple and on the right side of the visual uh, an operating model of Apple, operating or governance model of Apple. But here when you have a look, the roles and responsibilities, what you can derive out of the picture on the left are very different from what you can derive out of the right, of the picture on the right, which shows a clear difference between the operating and governance model of this company. This has also been brought to question in the EU investigation, in the EU Commission investigation, where the EU Commission has claimed that our Apple has artificially shifted income outside of the USA to its Irish subsidiaries. 
These subsidiaries were run by some of Apple's top executives who were located in USA, but all the profit was landing in Ireland. This was not brought, it although a well-known fact, was not brought to question before BEPS, but is of key importance after BEPS, because after BEPS, all tax authorities following the mandate set by the OECD are looking where are the key significant people involved in taking care of the operations present. So structures such as these are not only questionable, but also present a high risk for the MNEs. Thank you, Afisha. So from all this, we see a clear urge for synchronization of financial and tax data analytics. Um, and the first step to being fully in control is obtaining control over your financials and ensuring that they are fully aligned with your operational conduct, as we have seen so far in, in, the, in our story in the slides. This is absolutely essential in the current tax arena as availability of information facilitated by automatic exchange of information between governments mandates companies to be extremely careful in their selection of reported data. Selection of data to be reported for tax purposes begins with running financial data and tax data and scenarios to identify any mismatches between reported profit, tax and people in a jurisdiction. This is a highly challenging task, especially due to a number of different accounting principles applicable in different countries. This slide illustrates the various pieces on the storyboard of a multinational that should be assessed in a cumulative way and aligned while preparing the financial data to be reported. Um, what can be done to facilitate the process? The use of a software to store transactional data at the level of each jurisdiction in which the company has its operations is the beginning of gaining control over the quality of reliable financials. But before using any software, a preliminary selection needs to be made of the data required at country level. Thereafter, the data can be used to run scenarios and the ratio analysis to analyze the impact on the whole group or an individual group entity. And you can then analyze transfer pricing policies policies, tax rulings, or any other intercompany or third-party arrangements that the group has entered into. Moreover, using a software solution also limits room for error, increases efficiency in identifying the existence of outliers, and helps in developing strategies to mitigate any risks related to them. As referred to by Afisha already, in the OECD Country by Country Reporting Handbook on Effective Tax Risk, Manage Risk Assessment of last September, the format and indicators of conducting such a quantitative outliers analysis are provided. Um, and this handbook has been published to serve as a guidance to tax inspectors in the interpretation of the data filed by taxpayers in DC by C reporting. But obviously, it is strongly recommended to perform such financial ratio analysis yourself before you file your tax and transfer pricing documents. And it will most likely lead to disputes if you are not adequately prepared to defend your position when questions are raised by the tax authorities upon identification of any outliers resulting from inconsistencies between the financial versus tax data presented in your tax returns and, for example, CBC reports. And this would uh, not only result in heavy costs, but also time and reputational burdens for your company. And we now go then to the Caterpillar case, and another example. Um, uh, this example uh, also shows how important it is to properly maintain financial data analytics. This U.S. headquartered multinational that is active in producing and distribution construction equipment had used tax planning to shift 85% of U.S.-based income to Switzerland by artificially shifting the so-called spare parts business to Geneva, while all the significant people functions and the R&D behind it stayed in the USA. 
of its uh, 118,500 employees worldwide, about 52,000, so nearly half, work in the U.S., while only 400 employees, so less than half a percent, work in Switzerland. Of its 125 manufacturing facilities worldwide, 54 are in the U.S., while none are located in Switzerland. In 2012, of the $2 billion uh, Caterpillar spent on research and development, 80% of it was spent in the U.S., while less than 10% was spent in Switzerland. This conduct of Caterpillar has placed it in the middle of controversy as follows. Um, the lack of transparency by Caterpillar on issues such as the portion of profit contributed by the spare parts division to the total profit of the company led to the employees standing up and blowing up the operations and filing a civil suit. And it also led to an inquiry by the U.S. Senate Committee that decided against Caterpillar and its tax advisor. And the IRS started challenging the setup of the Swiss-based spare parts business, and especially the economic substance for the restructuring and the res resulting allocation of profits to Switzerland, which profit was actually generated mostly in the U.S. Um, this situation could have been assessed at an early stage and avoided by running financial projections such as FTE versus operating profit per jurisdiction or per group entity, for example. Even if multinationals do not run such analysis on their own, they will be done anyway by the tax authorities upon receipt of uh, the CRC reporting data or via information received from leakage or the public domain. Um, therefore, in an attempt to stay away from just disputes, multinationals should adopt proactivity in synchronizing financial data analytics with their operational conduct. Um, this, uh, the next slide is also an illustration on what information is disclosed in which document on tax and transfer pricing, which can be used for communication purposes. For example, so um, uh, the CFO, the management board, and audit committee uh, in this way get an insight in the data that gets reported through various tax and transfer pricing filings. And let's go to another example the Rio Tinto projections. Um, here, uh, this is the case uh, of, a, of a mining uh, giant. Rio Tinto, uh, that made its sales uh, revenues and taxes paid by location publicly available. Uh, we added to this information another pie chart showing global allocation of FTEs, which brought clear mismatches between location of employees versus location of sales revenue and corresponding taxes paid, as you can see in the diagram. For example, China that has most uh, rev sales revenue with no tax. This type of disclosure shows again that gaining control over your financial data is a crucial step in your today's compliance process. I hand over to Fischer again. Thanks, Marjorie. Yes, with all of these examples, our message is clear. You need to be compliant. But being compliant does not just mean preparing your document and filing it with the relevant tax authority. It means much more than that. And all of these examples go on to illustrate if you make your documents publicly available without being prepared on what is reported in them, then you are at a high risk. Just before we move on to the concluding slides, what is the main message we're trying to give out is before you do any compliance filings, you should start asking yourself some questions, such as, are you aware of all the information that is reported in your tax and TP files over the last five years? And if operationally, have there been any changes? Are you aware if the information reported for CIT purposes contradicts with the profile of the taxpayer for VAT purposes, for example? Are you aware of all the filing deadlines and do you have a mechanism to receive alerts of approaching filing deadlines, for example? 
in case you hear yourself answering no to one or more of these questions you should start with chalking out your deadlines clearly running your ratio analyses setting up your governance frameworks and only after completing all of these steps preparing and filing your reports now before we move on to the last section is this is this concept seeming similar or familiar to all any or all of the people online and is it raising any questions please feel free to type them in the chat box we will address them as and when they arise or at the end of the presentation moving further what are moving further and trying to summarize again what does a global approach to tax compliance bring to you a global approach to tax compliance ensures that none of the things that you report in your master file local file country by country report and or tp forms contradicts with what you do operationally as a company this visual goes on to illustrate that if you conduct a value chain analysis a holistic value chain analysis by which we mean if you look at how exactly your company works operationally and if that clearly matches with what you report in master file local file c by c reports and your cit returns then by just carrying out this exercise at a proactive level before any tax authorities are mandating you to do so through an audit for example just doing it as a proactive layer already reduces the chances of you getting into a dispute by less than 10% now as a next step if you were to also employ appropriate dispute dispute avoidance instruments to each part of your value chain for example a safe harbor for headquarter type services and apa perhaps for manufacturing operations in a country if you employ appropriate dispute avoidance instruments that further reduces your chances of getting into a litigation and even if you were to get into a litigation all of these steps that you carry out proactively help you defend your position in a court next we would like to through this slide talk to you about what are the different segments of your income the x y and z uh, z components reflected here are uh, x is your component of the income that is reported in tax there are even if there are disputes on this part of the income they are not they are going to be rather defendable as of now by all mnes part y and z are where most of your bets related disputes going to lie now what is y why is your tax provisioning income if you as a taxpayer do not employ any tax risk management instruments your portion of this y income could be very high therefore diluting the quality of your earnings An example to be kept in mind here is of Procter and Gamble, who entered into about 17 advance pricing agreements, uh, many of which were bilateral, with various governments, so as to gain certainty on their tax positions. By doing so, they were able to reduce their two billion of tax provisioning income to around 500 million, that is one fourth of it. that really helped them improve the quality of their earnings distributions to shareholders etc as a comp as a company if your y component is going so high which could after beps be questionable you should try to employ appropriate controversy management instruments to reduce the segment now the last segment said which has remained hidden not reported and not pay attention yet tax income is the most questionable part this is because till now this income has been hiding somewhere or the other and has been missing the notice of tax of at least the majority of tax authorities now why do we say this is important because in your cycr filing you have to report as in this as in a country in table 1 and 2 if some income is stateless by stateless we mean here if it is not taxed anywhere at all in the capacity of operating corporate income subject to corporate income tax that income if because you uh, in your cycr filing you need to make it clear which is this uh, 
stateless income and how much is it depending on if it is a high amount this is again where you put yourself in the where you put yourself at the risk of because risk of being caught in the middle of a controversy so this stresses on the same point that we have been talking about before that if you are aware of what deadlines are approaching what's the attitude of the government in those countries where your deadlines are approaching and you are prepared through either controversy instruments or through value chain analysis in a proactive manner you are prepared to prepare and file your doc the tax and transfer pricing documents in those countries that presents that pre prevents you from disputes in many jurisdictions in the post peps world on this slide we would like to refer back to what marshi spoke about earlier what are the six mistakes of the of taxpayers that lead them to getting into disputes such as being reactive such as being reactive means starting to defend your position only after you get an audit using a siloed approach etc what you should instead be doing is starting your mapping out your the steps in your journey towards full control what does this journey towards full control mean as a first step you need to synchronize your financial and tax data analytics you need to be fully in control of what is reported in the local cit return of each and every country where you have operations if you have not made a careful selection of the data to be reported in local country and global filings if you have not run ratio analysis to identify key areas of risk and then you will not be aware of the mismatches that will appear out of c by c r versus local tax returns and these mismatch when we call mismatches here we are not talking about mismatches that might appear out of accounting differences for example because those could still be explained very well in your table 3 we're talking about mismatches that we like to call red flags which companies typically do not explain in their table 3 and could be questioned by tax authorities as we said before who get a smaller portion of the total tax paid by the company in the entire world next step after you have gained clarity on your financial and tax data analytics is adopting a global approach to tax compliance of which this beps action calendar is the starting step what benefits does it bring to you you will be if you uh, if after your five if after gaining control over your financial and tax data analytics the next obvious step for you should be to start documenting it and documenting it in a way that each documentation does not contradict what you are reporting in any other documentation as a next step to be in full control you have run your you have gained control over your financial data analytics you have reported it in an ap appropriate and accurate manner as a next step you should try to optimize your etr it might look bleak in with governments coming out with regulations every day almost it might look bleak your chances of etr optimization in the post peps world but that is not true we just took an example of procter and gamble how they were able to reduce their tax provisioning and how they were able to reduce their tax provisioning income you can still employ strategies to go ahead in the post webs world and optimize your etr impact as well as a next step which we have also focused on previously in this in the course of this presentation is aligning your governance and operational conduct how to do this the concept raci which means assigning a person responsibility accountability consulting uh, the appropriate people and informing the appropriate people should be the backbone of any structure of yours be it operational be it tax driven governance structure and clear reporting lines should be the backbone of any of your risk management plan a next step for you towards full control would be then managing in house challenges and arranging for clear and efficient communication to stakeholders what we mean here is prevent yourself from internal challenges such as 
make sure internally people are aware of your tax and transfer pricing policies as much as they're aware of your operational strategies. This would prevent you from the risk of whistleblowers going out on your company and leaking sensitive documents of your company, which if you are unprepared could be a very huge threat for you. And as a final step, the clear and efficient communication is also to external stakeholders. With, as Marjorie was mentioning in the beginning of the presentation, the personal reputation of the directors of the company and board members is at stake as well in the post webs world. So it's not only it's not only companies that would get penalties, but people in the companies who would get personal fines and personal indictment, for example, in some countries. In order to avoid all of that, it is important for you to communicate clearly with your external stakeholders as well and not let them be become aware of your company's tax and transfer pricing policies only upon filing and filing publicly th this information. To sum up the presentation, what should you as what should be your post peps plan to be fully in control? You should start with chalking out an yearly plan, which clearly lists out from January till December which are the key deadlines you have to meet. Secondly, you should rank those deadlines in order of high or low risk. Uh, as a second point here, you should be moving away from a siloed approach. What we mean here is when you're preparing your tax documentation, the tax people prepare involved in that preparation should not be kept away from the finance or the operational people. They should be meeting regularly to make sure they know what is happening in the company operationally. And that is exactly what's reflected in their tax transfer pricing documentation. Next step would be to gain control over your financial data. You should be aware as a company what has been reported in each and every one of your countries in the last five years. Have there been any audit risks over that financial data that has been reported? Has there been any questions raised by any tax authorities and have you answered them satisfactorily? Is the next question you should be asking yourself. And only after you've gained control over your financial data, you will be able to define clear reporting lines or if not defined, check whether the reporting lines are in fact efficiently set and do they really match the roles and responsibility reposed in entities. Next, you should be employing software for taking care of your routine and repetitive tasks. The importance of this could not be stressed more because if your compliance burden is increasing, that means your tax costs are increasing as well. And if you are employing people to take care of all of those deadlines, not only does it put you at a risk of those deadlines being missed, the data reported in those deadlines being mismatched, but if you use a software, it reduces the chances of human error. And if you are able to clearly chalk out what are your routine and repetitive tasks, it might be a one-time investment, but in the future years, it provides you greater certainty as well as reduced costs. And lastly, cannot stress on this enough, communicate to both internal and external stakeholders before and after preparation and filing of your tax and transfer pricing documentation. Thank everyone for attending and hope to see you at our next webinar.